Hello and welcome to Medical Dialogues, your daily dose of health and medical news. I am Dr. Nandita Mohan and here is what we have for you all from the world of medicine. The new approach in chronic wound healing. The incidence of chronic wounds is increasing due to the aging population and the augment of people afflicted with diabetes. Now, knowledge on the biological mechanisms underlying these diseases, there is a lot of medical technologies underlying this to conventionally treat the wounds. However, wound healing differs from person to person. Several nanotechnologies have been developed demonstrating unique characteristics that address specific amount of problems related to wound repair mechanisms. A review in the Advanced Wound Care Journal focused on the most recently developed nanotechnology-based therapeutic agents and evaluated the efficacy of each treatment in diabetic models. The success of topically administered growth factors in chronic wounds is definitely limited. Due to their short in vivo half-life, low absorption rate through the outermost skin later around the wound, as well as rapid elimination by exudation before reaching the wound bed might limit the efficacy of growth factors topical application. Conventional medications containing growth factors need to be applied in high doses or rather be repeatedly administered over a long period, leading to important side effects and increasing the cost of the therapy. Presently, platelet-derived growth factor, fibroblast growth factor and epidermal growth factors are some routinely or rather widely studied for their application in growth factor-mediated wound repair. A major advantage of these nanoplatforms is they are acceptable, adaptable and tunable. For instance, nanotherapeutics can be used in controlled and sustained releases of the active ingredient over a period of days or weeks, while the conventional delivery systems such as dressings, films or even gels can sustain the release of the therapeutic agent over 1-2 to two days only. The new chronic wound nanotherapeutics are multifunctional platforms that promote the wound healing and minimal scar formation happens, avoid or rather treat the bacterial contamination and can even release the active biomolecules encapsulated at specific rates that match the wound healing necessities. This rare condition of hypoglycemia in critically ill patients. Hyperglycemia is a common response to an acute illness but it is not often. The frequency and the cause of hypoglycemia in septic patients have not yet been elucidated. A retrospective review of 265 patients in the journal Acute Medicine and Surgery assessed the patients with sepsis who were admitted to a tertiary medical centre. The blood glucose levels on admission were evaluated. The study, which focused on sepsis-associated hypoglycemia in the early phase and also evaluated the impact of hypoglycemia on mortality. The researchers categorized the patients with sepsis into five groups according to their blood glucose levels. Seven patients were admitted with severe hypoglycemia, 19 with mild case, 103 with euglycemia, 58 with mild hyperglycemia and 78 with hyperglycemia. There was a significant difference in the 28-day mortality between those with severe hypoglycemia and euglycemia. Hence, the researchers concluded that septic patients with severe hypoglycemia had significantly higher mortality compared with patients with euglycemia. Assessments of sedatives during the acute phase under sedation protocols for patients with sepsis. A recent study reported that propofol is a better choice of sedative compared to midazolam based on a light sedation protocol that might be associated with inappropriate sedation during the acute phase with increased coma and delirium. The study was an analysis of data from the dexmethodamine for sepsis in ICU randomized evaluation trial, which was the desired trial. Patients were divided into propofol and midazolam groups based on continuously usage of the drug and sedation control between these groups was compared on day 3. They assessed the incidence of delirium, the length of ICU stay, number of ventilator-free days within the first 28 days period and mortality after 28 days. The results showed that both the groups had similar characteristics except for age and emergency surgery. The number of well-controlled sedation patients in the propofol group on day 3 was significantly higher than that in the midazolam group. The incidence of daily coma and delirium within the initial week was different between these two groups and it increased with the midazolam administration. 
the number of confusion assessment method for ICU positive patients was significantly higher in the midazolam group compared to the propofol group. Hence, it was concluded that in patients with sepsis requiring mechanical ventilation sedation with midazolam based on a light sedation protocol may be associated with inappropriate sedation during the acute phase with increased coma and delirium as compared to the propofol group. The most favorite habit of all generations, that is watching television, to be a major fatal risk factor for heart disease. According to the British Heart Foundation, coronary heart disease is one of the leading causes of death. It's responsible for around 64,000 deaths each year. People with coronary heart disease are twice as likely to develop even a stroke. Watching too much of television is associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease regardless of an individual's genetic makeup. In a study published in BMC Medicine, the researchers showed that assuming a causal link, 11% of the cases with coronary heart disease could be prevented if people watched less than an hour of television each day. To examine the link between time spent in screen-based sedentary behaviors such as TV viewing and leisure time computer use and individuals' DNA, their risk of coronary heart disease, the researchers examined over 500,000 adults who have been followed up prospectively for about 12 years. The team created polygenic risk scores for each individual, that is, their genetic risk of developing a coronary heart disease. As expected, the individuals with a higher polygenic risk score were at greater risk of developing the condition. People who watched more than 4 hours of TV per day were at a greater risk of the disease regardless of their polygenic risk score. Compared to these individuals, people who watched 2 or 3 hours of TV a day had a relative 6% lower rate of developing the condition, while those who watched less than an hour of television had a relative 16% lower rate. Therefore, the researchers concluded that limiting the TV viewing might be helpful in preventing coronary heart disease. Individuals who watch TV for less than one hour a day were less likely to develop the condition independent of their genetic risk. That's all for today. Stay tuned to Medical Dialogues for latest updates. Never miss a medical update from Medical Dialogues. Like, subscribe and press the bell icon.